Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the India Report. The India Report was a publication, uh, and I've got a copy of it here, a facsimile. It's going to, the talk's going to be in three sections. Um, firstly, I'm going to deal with the report written by Charles and Ray Eames in 1958. Um, you've just seen a montage of stills um, of both designers and selected work, including fabric design, toy designs and furniture. The second part will focus on the legacy of the report as witnessed from first-hand research and accounts um, from present and past faculty and also from my own visit there in January. And finally, I will give an account of my involvement with NID during the International Open Elective 2015 and the way in which internationalisation and collaboration impacts on student activity today. Uh, you've been given a little leaflet which I actually had printed out in uh, India. It was part of the idea of collaborating with the students, the staff and the actual facilities including a really wonderful uh, printing unit. So 54 years ago, the National Institute of Design was established in Ahmedabad, uh, and that's in northwest India. Its backbone was a manifesto for design education, developed and presented in, in April 1958 by Charles and Ray Eames, and they were American designers, who were very famous for a lot of what has now become important mid-century uh, design classics. And the NID campus um, officially opened in 1961. The report itself is quite dense um, in terms of information. It's a light read if you look at it one way, but what's inside it is very um, thorough and has a lot of impact. So the Government of India asked for recommendations on a programme of training in design that would serve as an aid to the small industries bearing in mind that India was full of craftspeople who were making artefacts but weren't necessarily manufacturing them to uh, a national, let alone international audience. They were concerned that there was a sort of need to resist um, the present rapid deterioration of design and quality of consumer goods. So a lot of what was happening in, in India and being manufactured was actually uh, in danger of uh, becoming lost in, and, and the identity of it being lost in Western products being brought uh, into the country. So Charles and Ray Eames, American industrial designers, visited India for three months at the invitation of the government with the sponsorship of the Ford Foundation to explore the problems of design and to make recommendations for a training program. The Eames toured throughout India making a careful study of many centres of design, handicrafts and general manufacture. Um, they talked with many individuals, official and non-official, in the field of small and large industry. So it was a very thorough tour. Um, and they looked at design and architecture. Now, one of the things that uh, was important to the Eames was the actual artefacts that were being made and that had been made for centuries um, in India. And one was the Lota. You've seen this on the poster, probably. Uh, that is a loader, it's a vessel for carrying water. That was an illustration by Pierre Tomé, who was one of my um, accompanying artists over for the Open Electives. He's from Switzerland and teaches illustration at Lucerne. So uh, there's the loader. And what was interesting was the fact that the, uh, the loader itself is a vessel for carrying water. That, that's all it is, it, it's just a vessel for carrying water. But they admired it, and during their visit to India, the Lota, a simple vessel of everyday use, stood out as perhaps the greatest and most beautiful thing that they found. It's amazing, it's just a simple vessel. The, the village women, which we've got an illustration here, they used um, this, uh, this sort of vessel for uh, all sorts of things as well as carrying water. They actually would use it for carrying other objects as well. So it had to have lots of different um, qualities. And they would actually uh, use tamarind and ash uh, to turn the brass into gold. That's how they saw it, and they would polish these things. And it became something that almost was like alchemy. So how would you go about designing a loader? This was one of the things they asked. 
First of all, you'd have to shut out all the preconceived ideas of the subject and then begin to consider factor after factor. The optimum amount of liquid to be fetched, carried, poured and stored in a prescribed set of circumstances. The size and strength and gender of the hands. Now these are things that you know, designers have to think about. Who's holding it? Um, the size and uh, the way it is to be transported by head, hip, hand, basket or cart. The balance, the center of gravity, when empty, when full, its balance when rotated for pouring. So again, all of these things were being looked at. The fluid dynamics of the problem, not only when pouring, but when filling and cleaning, and under the complicated motions of head carrying, slow and fast. Its sculpture, as it fits the palm of the hand, the curve of the hip. Its sculpture as a complement to the rhythmic motion of walking or static uh, post at the well. The relation of opening to volume in terms of storage uses and objects other than liquid. I'm just listing these things, but these are things that they talked about. The size and opening of the inner contour in terms of cleaning. The texture inside and out in terms of cleaning and feeling. So even feeling this thing was very important. Heat transfer, can it be grasped when the liquid is hot? You know, we take all this for granted, but these are things that makes the lotus so special as an object. How pleasant does it feel? Eyes closed, eyes open. How pleasant does it sound when it strikes another vessel? You know, these are things that, uh, again, have, have all been considered. When it's set down on the ground or stone, empty or full, or being poured into. So just the sensations of this object. What is the possible material? What is the cost in terms of working? What is its cost in terms of ultimate service? And what kind of investment does the material provide as a product, a salvage? So afterwards, you know, what value does it have? And it goes on and on. But it does say that, of course, no man could have possibly designed the loader. It's almost something that's evolved organically by the need for this vessel to function. And the number of com combinations of factors to be considered gets to be astronomical. This is something that the Eames were fascinated about, how many ways this could multiply into um, all of the... Uh, possibilities. Okay, so um, talking about the, the institution, well at the very beginning of the Eames report, they quote a Sanskrit poet, you have the right to work, but for the work's sake only. You have no right to the fruits of work. Desire for the fruits of work, you must never be your own motive in working. Never give way to laziness either. Now, this is slightly contradictory for Western readers because it's suggesting that you only are working for the actual love of working. Uh, that's Bhagavad Gita. So, moving on, um, what about the actual institution? What did they hope to get? Well, that's Charles Eames, as you can see there. And at the time, um, Professor Vyas said, we knew that we couldn't teach the, way, the usual ways as in art schools, so they realised that they couldn't necessarily teach um, the way that Western art schools did and that the Eames had brought from India. The Eames report was there in the background, but we wanted our own thing. We were not there to follow, rather to, to translate it. And in the early days, um, in the first 10 years, they had a small number of students. This was very personal learning. Each student grew at their own pace. Now, this is quite interesting when we look at education now in the West, as well as now in India. Back then, there was a very big influence of the West, but then we got introduced to our own culture. And this is really important that the Indian culture was being actually um, given back to them, but through this uh, report. And throughout uh, my visit to India, I was researching Charles Eames. So, if we're looking at the legacy of what became of uh, the report. This is the uh, entrance to the um, Amnavar campus. They've got one in Bangalore and one in uh, Gandhinagar, which is just north of uh, Amnavar. So as I walked around, I was looking for elements, and this is what I was trying to do. I was trying to trace the influence of these two designers. So I had this campus to wander around to try and find where they'd left their mark. The building itself is very much uh, an important statement, built in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, 
it was a, a significant piece of architecture. And in Ahmedabad, you do get architecture by Louis Kahn and um, uh, Le Corbusier. Some of it in not a particularly good state at the moment. So PenID, the institution, the National Institute of Design, where I was based, they did have a gallery which was talking about how design had enabled India. So there was lots of artifacts. And within that, they do have um, collections of Eames's work. So within the little design museum they have on campus, you can find the chair. Um, if you go to the library there, they've got all of the Vitra scale models, which are quite nice to, um, to physically hold. Uh, before I went, Professor Aftab Agard gave me a copy of the um, design journal, which was to commemorate um, Eames the year after he passed away in 1977. Um, and I was trying to sort of trace that legacy, of, so I was looking for the actual book itself, which was in the library. And then if you go to the library, they have lots of books on post, uh, sorry, on modernism, on furniture. Again, it's, it's an interesting library in a sense that it has many, many books, but there is an emphasis on Western modernism of the mid-20th century. Um, I quite like the way that Eames are spread out there and it echoes the um, palm trees outside. It's a beautiful campus, and it's in many ways uh, one of the joys of going over to NID was the fact that I got time to live and uh, work on this campus. And you walk around these spaces, it's a really quite poetic the way they're uh, developed and designed and the, and the artifacts that you find amongst them. So I was looking for Eames, where do I find him? I found him in the library, I found objects of his. Um, there's a map there, I don't know if you can, probably can't read it, but um, Eames Plaza is number seven there. Eames Plaza, there's a space, this quite wonderful green area in the middle of the campus, which is um, Eames Plaza. There's a little plaque, so again, looking for details, trying to find where he's commemorated. It's almost as if he never existed. You've got to find the artifacts to understand his presence there. Um, and again, before the building was developed, there was a monument on the site of the building and uh, they built around it, and that's part of Eames Plaza. Peacocks, monkeys, camels, elephants, all featured in my visit. Uh, and it was not uncommon to find monkeys every day, but I only saw them once, which was a bit of a shame. It happened to be on the um, Republic Day, when the president was giving a speech, the monkeys decided to appear, uh, which was quite a wonderful moment. And then, you know, the building itself is built around these quite ancient trees. So um, you can see that, you know, that features again, and the building itself, being concrete, fits in quite well, surprisingly, with the nature around it. As I said, I was exploring the campus, I was photographing it, I was talking to people, and generally wanting to know, you know, how much of the legacy was there. It's interesting to think that when they first started, the challenge of the programme was that it was committed to include a variety of disciplines. And here's a list which isn't complete, but these are the sort of things that they were delivering. Engineering economics, structural art history, mechanical political history, production agriculture, physics, dance and drama, philosophy, logistics, mathematics, painting, physiolo physiology, communications, anthropology, theory and techniques, psychology, statistics, architecture, graphics, that's the one thing we're probably understanding amongst all of those, um, music, literature, sculpture, demo demography. So this is the sort of subjects that they were proposing to deliver. Uh, Kumar Vyas, the Institute's first director, he said in 1961, the, the year of the idea of the NID, the Eames India report was there in the background, but we wanted our own thing. We were not there to follow, rather to translate it. But of course it was brilliant, it was a beacon. Shilpa Das, head of the research, uh, said that the India report was profound metaphysical. Um, and some of the very first projects were big exhibitions like the India exhibition or government assignments. At the New York World's Fair, they designed restaurants, everything from graphic space, cutlery, textile. So they were taking 
their designers that they trained over to America to show what they could do. As I, as I said, on the campus itself, evidence of craftsmanship, and that's always very relevant to the foundation of NID, is the craftsmanship alongside modern technology working harmoniously. So I was there, this is the third section of the talk, I was there because I'd applied to do the um, International Open Elective. I spoke to Aptam and we discussed uh, uh, it as a good idea. I then approached uh, Professor David Roberts to see if he would support that and he agreed to. And my um, elective, which I will, this is the elective brochure, it's quite interesting. It's, it's got all of the options here that you could choose. If you were a student, you would choose one of these options. And I was fortunate that quite a lot of students were interested in visual language and narrative sequence, which was the um, module I was offering. The general overriding theme was drawing by design, so it did apply to my own um, background and my own um, training. I'm an illustrator and a graphic artist, so it was quite appropriate. And that was the wonderful poster that um, was designed by uh, Taron, who was one of the uh, faculty over there. He runs uh, graphic design. So that's me, and that was the sort of thing I would experience. I'd experience a lot of engaged students. They were really quite um, excited by the fact that they had international artists come over and talk to them about their work. Um, and that's what was good, is that I was working alongside uh, Indian faculty that were from all around India as well as NID, and people from Switzerland, uh, Berlin, and uh, we had a, an Amer a North American lady really come over. Because of the space, I was able to do uh, workshops outside, outdoor critiques. We had lots of drawing projects to do. Every day I was working solidly with these students, designing books, uh, doing illustrations, um, working on this theme of narrative and se sequence. But we would sometimes go out to uh, locations in the country. This was a stepwell that we all visited. A stepwell is a, an interior a piece of architecture that goes into the earth, down to the well, the water, and it's all built like a temple. Uh, mainly for the, uh, the weather being very hot in the summer, that you would want a respite from this heating, you would go down into these cool chambers. And this was all done on the um, Eames Plaza, which was uh, a nice thing. But we did have studios where I would give lectures. And one of the things that particularly fascinated students was the fact that we could take materials from the print room up into the studio, which we've been doing in Viscom um, and in other areas of um, BIAD. And uh, there was a lot about mutual discussion as well, so we were able to share ideas, those that I brought from England and those that were already there in India that they could pass on to me. So it was a really good learning curve, and I was able to understand their culture. It was my first visit, so this was very important to me to see where they were coming from. Uh, we did things like decorating the studio, so we made their environments something that was quite organic. And this is something that we've talked about in visual communication, to make spaces where you feel really at home, really that say this is about art and image making. And so uh, there were quite large scale um, paper constructions. I'm going to do some of these with my own students. It's by being there and being challenged by some of the things happening in India that I was able to formulate ideas I could bring back here and test out. And one of the things that they were always asked to do was to make notes, put down ideas, formulate ways of actually expressing those ideas to everyone so we could share them and build on them. So it became like a visual diary that happened every, every day of the year. It was very intense. And they had to come up with a book. I've showed students in uh, illustrations this morning some examples of the books that they made. And there were some quite remarkable uh, pieces made in that short time. Then we got lots of things like tape, we did lots of tape drawings. The tape drawings were very important because it meant that um, they didn't have to draw with pencils, they could draw with other things and, and simply create structures that wouldn't necessarily exist on paper but they could exist on concrete. So this was my elective. Alongside that, and I'm just going to read out some of the electives that were taking place. Drawing your personal voice printmaking, serigraphy, that's screen printing, woodcut etching, that was in Bangalore. Star peacock airplane kites, 3D drawing, 
uh, drawing from the mind, the aroma of the soil, narrative and communication. So you had to choose one of these. The visual essay is drawn journalism. That was the one that was produced by uh, Pierre Tom from Switzerland. Expressive lettering, that was a very popular one. Draw the world to know the world. So some of them were also philosophical. So paper making was uh, a great activity that one of the faculty had offered. And you can see they were making it in these spaces around the campus. So outdoor activity. The results were these wonderful pieces of handmade paper. <coughs> and then you can see they were exhibited at the end on this uh, structure. Again, I never shot of that. But for me, one of the really exciting things was that uh, they invited Gond artists to come and demonstrate their work. Gond artists are uh, craftspeople who make visual drawings, dots and lines, but what's this, it's almost like a specific discipline that they can't stop until they fill a portion of the drawing with the uh, visual gestures. So it might be dots, it might be lines. So you can see here. And some of the most famous uh, Gond artists working at the moment visited. Uh, Tara Books uh, produce really wonderful books um, using Gond artists, and the narratives are obviously to do with the personal stories that they're telling. I was fascinated by Gond artists before I'd gone to this, so it was an extra special thing that they came and demonstrated it, and people opted to do that class. And as I say, there were um, artists who were coming and doing hand lettering. Uh, this was a particularly successful Yes, it was uh, Kriti Monga, who was a graphic designer working in uh, India, and she came and she offered this workshop, so that was great to see uh, hand lettering, and she was drawing with brushes, uh, mops, and uh, rags on the floor, so all of this was done just with water on concrete. So at the end of it, uh, the students were required, all the students doing the modules were required to put up an exhibition of the work they'd done over two weeks. So it was quite pressurised and there was a, an outcome and that had to be assessed by myself and colleagues. So my students uh, arranged this space with their drawings. Uh, they made lots of books, not so dissimilar to what students have done here. So books, posters, uh, zines were exhibited and sold. And this is the opening night uh, where people came from outside to visit and spend time uh, looking at the work that's been done. And uh, some of the it, photographs of the studios were used as part of the exhibit to almost bring the studio down into the ex exhibition space. And we also encouraged students to put up their process, their work in progress, so it didn't have to be a finished item, it was how they made the work. So a lot of it was quite experimental, but alongside the finished products gave a full uh, account of the activity and made it made more sense of how it was uh, resolved. And the feedback from students was very positive. I think they, they generally felt that all of the electives were successful and that they gained something by trying things they hadn't done before. Whilst I was there, I was fortunate to be able to be uh, in Namdabar where Gandhi had his ashram. I visited that and uh, I noticed these postcards <coughs> Just a drawings of Gandhi, um, done by R. K. Laxman, who was, uh, I just thought this looked amazing, who's this uh, artist? I looked on the back, I found his name, I didn't think any more of it, but felt it was quite special. And during the time I was there, unfortunately he passed away because he was in his 90s, he was obviously very uh, old. Um, this was quite a mournful, you know, the India Times had big supplement about him, and he was very significant because he drew this character called the Common Man, and the Common Man was this cartoon figure who would just appear without saying anything uh, throughout history, if you like. Each, each cartoon that Laxman did, the Common Man would be there, and some event from history would be unfolding, and he would just happen to be an observer of it. Some was political, some was quite uh, revolutionary, some was just everyday things that happened, maybe it might have been a tragedy, but the Common Man was there. And so students decided to uh, do a tribute, that's the common man there, the, in, in tape. They decided to do this tape drawing of the common man that was there as a tribute to the fact that this great uh, practitioner of graphic art had passed away just recently. The people I would like to thank um, 
in particular uh, are Yvette, uh, Yvette Byrne, Kaushik Chakraborty, Taran Deep Gerda, both of those were responsible for the Open Elective organization. Sarah, my wife, uh, Rishika, uh, she helped me design the um, little leaflet that you've got there, and that was something that was exciting because we worked together on it. David Roberts supported the trip. Uh, the students at NID were excellent, and I really do thank them for being such good people to work with. And uh, Pierre Tomé, who was the illustrator, I really learnt a lot from because we had lots of great conversation. Uh, so that made it very valuable. You have to pay to go to the school. It, it becomes a quite a heavy fee and obviously, like you'd imagine, only certain sections of uh, the population would probably have that privilege. It is um, renowned as probably one of the most important uh, design schools, uh, not only in India, but is recognized internationally. And that's why it has strong links with uh, other countries, including America, England, and uh, Switzerland in this case. But yeah, they would have to pay a fee. Textiles is very important, and textiles was something that, you know, uh, you, when you were over there, you, you were surrounded by wonderful uh, textile workshops within the college, but also around the city as well, you could see that. So textiles, furniture, product design, film and animation, photography, I'm looking at Robert there, <laughs> photography was very strong. Um, and then jewellery, um, um, accessory design, toy design, but not all at that campus, some was uh, at Gandhinagar. But that list I think was just interesting to read out because I didn't recognise half of the... It sounded like a very kind of multidisciplinary approach. Yeah. But that, in, in a way, that was what was exciting, was the idea that they did believe in multidisciplinary um, activity, and yeah. still do, and something that we believe in here. So there was a nice correlation between our two philosophies. Um, you're bombarded with uh, colour, things that you've never seen in your life, no matter how much people prepare you and say that that's going to be the case, until you arrive, probably... Uh, it could be the chaotic road system where I didn't know if I was going to live or die. Um, just simply seeing maybe a camel or an elephant walking across the street. But I, I think it was just the, the, the actual campus itself will stay with me because I stayed on it and was in a guest house within the campus. And it meant that every day we ate together, we, we talked together. And it was, it was a really communal experience, which I don't have that very often because I usually stay in hotels or I stay in places removed from where I'm working. So to live and work and socialise on the same site, I think, uh, we stay with them. But wonderful people as well, I think.